Today we focus on the history of resistance in the Caribbean. We'll have a conversation with Dr. Morrison Pierre, the author of a new book on anti-colonial resistance in Guyana. That's our program today. Don't go anywhere. Carib Nation is up next. Welcome to Carb Nation, I'm David Hines. Just when we think that we have heard everything that there is to know about the colonial struggle in the Caribbean, a new book comes out. Well, we have another new one, and this time it's by Dr. Morrison Pierre, no stranger to Carib Nation. His new book, Anatomy of Resistance, Anti-Colonialism in Guyana, 1823 to 1966. Dr. Sinpier, welcome to Carib Nation once again. Welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, um, I know when you were working on this book, I, um, you kept me informed from time to time um, of your progress. And now, here is the finished product. Um, Anatomy of Resistance, Anti-Colonialism in Guyana, 1823 to 1966. What motivated you to write this book? Well, uh, David, uh, there are a number of reasons. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, in my judgment, there was no full-length study of the political independence movement in Guyana. Uh, the book uh, deals, I would imagine, primarily with the political independence movement in Guyana. But it takes a different perspective. Uh, secondly, uh, many people who deal with um, social movements start from a particular point in time. Uh, for instance, uh, this, with respect to the civil rights movement, uh, some people said that it began in 1955 when Mrs. Sparks uh, refused to give up her seat. Um, some people have argued that with respect to Guyana, the political independence movement began in the early 1940s with the return of uh, Dr. and Mrs. Jagan to Guyana. Uh, when I interviewed the leaders, uh, they told me, they said, listen, this thing started long before we came on the scene. So I felt that it was necessary to go right back, as it were, to the origins. My argument is that wherever you have oppression, you're likely to have resistance. And secondly, you'll find that although the resistance might have take, taken a particular form, as it did with respect to the political independence movement, many of the tactics and strategies and so on were in fact put in place by the early risers, by the slaves, for instance, by the Amerindians and so on. Hence the 1823 starting point. Um, you could have gone further back. You could have gone to the 1763 rebellion. Absolutely. Why 1823? Absolutely. Well, the 1763 rebellion was obviously important. Kofi and Akara, as you know, took over Barbies for a certain period of time. And that was definitely uh, important. But why I chose to deal with the 1823 rebellion uh, was because perhaps for three reasons. Uh, first of all, it's propinquity to the time when emancipation occurred on the 1st of August in 1834. And in my judgment, the slaves were very instrumental in hastening the demise of slavery. Yeah. T tell us. Tell us what happened in 1823 in a nutshell. Fine. Well, what happened there was, uh, I would imagine some people would argue that it was a pacific rebellion, a peaceful rebellion. Only three uh, whites appeared to have lost their lives and not at the hands of the slaves. And what happened there, basically, this was important because it seems to me that this was at once illustrative of the extent to which the slaves were conscious of the contribution of, that their labor power made to the progress and to the viability of the plantation system. So as a consequence, they, they, they rose. But what was interesting was they used a number of resources. You know, there was a time when there was a feeling that when people rebelled, when they rioted, there was something non-rational about it. These people were, 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 were uh, people who had certain problems. But when we begin to look, for instance, at the techniques and the strategies used by the slaves, they use time, for instance, which is a very, very important factor, very, very important resource. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the leaders of the rebellion, Jack Gladstone, who was the son of Kwamina, one of the important leaders of the, of the rebellion, had a number of conversations with a brother. He called him a brother, Daniel, who was a servant in the government, uh, at government house. Now both uh, Kwamina and Daniel were literate. Gladstone also had a number of conversations with his former wife, Susanna. Uh, 
and they then developed a strategy. They call it the strategy involving the sensible people. They use misinformation. They use rumor. They use their closeness to the, 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 the planters. And most importantly, they use the chapel of the Reverend John Smith as a setting to plot the rebellion. So these then were actions of people who were thinking. These are rational uh, individuals. And I think for those reasons, and of course others, the 1823 slave insurrection is certainly a, an important uh, point to start. In terms of organization. Absolutely. And what, what eventually happened um, to the rebellion? Well, uh, what happened, uh, uh, first of all, is that um, the planters responded in a draconian fashion. This, of course, was not unusual mm -hmm. because they saw this as a challenge to their, to their power, their hegemony. Uh, for instance, uh, Kwamina was shot and he was killed. And his, his corpse was gibbeted and left hanging in chains for weeks so that passerbys would see it. And this clearly was meant to deter any prospective rebellion. 250 slaves were also killed. And in addition to that, the Reverend John Smith, a white missionary, who came in 1808 to Guyana, was implicated in the rebellion, found guilty, tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death. Well, this was kind of unusual. That was the first instance of a, of a white person. I would imagine yeah. so. Uh -huh. I would imagine so. This is very unusual. But it clearly showed the extent to which the planters, the plantocracy, and to a certain extent, the, 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 the administration felt that this was a serious threat to their power, and they would use whatever means that, you know, that were necessary. Uh, also, what happened was the slaves uh, were able to develop or to derive a certain amount of amelioration from this experience. For instance, after the 1823 slave interaction, they were able to marry, they, they, they were able to give evidence in a court of law, uh, the, the working days, were, the hours were in fact decreased and so on. Uh, there was um, um, an, effort, an effort was made so as to stop slaves being flogged in the field, and also an effort was made to stop female fl so slaves. So there, uh, there was some sort of a victory coming out of this, this uprising. Absolutely. Happening in 1823, just 11 years before the abolition of slavery yes. in Guyana and the English-speaking Caribbean. Yes. Come 1834, slavery is abolished, and a new dispensation occurs in Guyana. Talk about that mm -hmm. and what that means for what that means for, for the, the resistance movement? Well, I think it's important to recognize that slavery, in so far as it was defined by the British and the planters, was abolished. Okay? It did not mean that the slaves or the ex-slaves would get freedom. Okay. As a matter of fact, the governor made it quite clear in a proclamation earlier on in 1833. I think it was in August 1833. His words were, some of you foolish people have come to the conclusion that you are to be free. Okay, this is not the case. Nothing would give me more pleasure, he said, than to see you working peaceably for your employers. So in other words, to think to be free was to be foolish. And he said that if you resisted the system, however unpalatable it is to him, he would find it necessary to react. Mm -hmm. So apprenticeship came into existence, came into existence in 1834. And the ex-slaves were known as apprentices. But they then rebelled against the system. As a matter of fact, four days after emancipation, on the 5th of August, 1834, a number of slaves decided to riot, and they were punished with the cat of nine tails. Four days afterwards, between August the 9th and August 11th, a slave by the name, uh, an, an apprentice rather, by the name of Damon, led a rebellion. It was considered to be a riotous assembly led a rebellion. Actually, it, again, it was a strike. This was in Essequibo? Yes, this was in Essequibo. Right. And remember that the, 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 the slaves as early risers had shown that the system was vulnerable. They recognized that they were conscious of the contribution that their labor power made to the viability of the system. So that the apprentices continued. And of course, the reaction was equally draconian. Mm -hmm. uh, David was hanged. For instance, many of the slaves were trans uh, apprentices, I keep calling them slaves, maybe right. as a Freudian slip, were transported. And the result is that although apprenticeship was meant to last for six years, it was truncated and eventually came to an end in 1838. By this time, indentured laborers, um, Portuguese, Chinese, East Indians had begun to come to Guyana. Absolutely. And this meant something new yes. for the colony. Talk about that. Right. Well, uh, first of all, uh, the Portuguese and the Chinese uh, that, that come, as, you, as, as you've rightly said, 
but they were not able to stand up to the rigors of the plantation and many of them left as a consequence. I'm going to come back momentarily to the Portuguese. The East Indians uh, first came in 1838, but their, their uh, mortality rates were dreadful. And as a consequence, the, the Indian government decided to uh, temporarily cease indentureship, indentureship. But it restarted again subsequently and continued unabated from about 1851 until 1917. Now, getting back to the Portuguese, what was important here was the Portuguese were given preferential treatment. And I often wonder about that. As you know, Portugal is, is, a, is a country in Europe, and perhaps this was something that was on the minds of the British, the British government and, of course, the planters. They were given preferential treatment. Uh, they were given opportunities to start businesses. They, were, they, they had the opportunity to become dual citizens. They could seek the protection of the Portuguese government. They could sing the, national, the Portuguese national anthem and so on. The result is, and furthermore, within the field of business, within the field of business, in many instances, they treated the Creoles rather badly. The result is that the Creoles resisted this system by rioting in 1856. You had anti-Portuguese riots in 1856. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of our viewers, eh? um, mm -hmm. explain what's a Creole. Well, what happened there was that was that you had the slaves, and then they became apprentices, and then after the system of apprenticeship, they were known as Creoles. But Creoles re referred primarily to those people of color who were born in British Guyana. White people were born in, 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 in no, these black, black, black people, people sorry, black people, sorry. Who were born in, in, That's right. in, in Guyana. Because do not forget, there were Africans also. Right. There were some who came from who Sierra came, Leone. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they came from Sierra Leone. So they were, um, were, were viewed a bit differently in terms of nomenclature. But when we speak of Creoles, we're thinking primarily about people who are born, black people usually, who were born in the, um, in the West Indies, uh, in, in British Guyana, as it was at the time, but who have adopted some of the culture of the Europeans. Of the Europeans. Okay. okay. So um, Chinese came, Portuguese came, East Indians came. And there has always been this question that um, from the time of the landing of these indentured laborers, uh, an atmosphere of, of mistrust mm -hmm. between uh, them on the one hand and the ex-African slaves. Their slaves, yeah. Um, address that question. Of course. Uh, there was a question of race. Now, as you probably are aware, and I'm quite sure the viewers are also aware, one of the policies of colonialism, one of the factors of colonialism is the notion of divide and rule. And the British government certainly used that in Guyana with respect to the East Indians and with respect to the Africans, and also with respect to the Amerindians and Africans, and as we said before, with, with respect to the Portuguese and the, um, and the people of African descent. Now, what happened in 1848 was there was a strike. There was a strike. The, the, the planters decided, to, to, in 1846, there was the, the Sugar Duties Act, Sugar Duties Act. Mm -hmm. And during that act, the British government decided that they would like to get sugar from cheaper sources. So, as, so this then began to hurt the planters. The planters decided to reduce the wages of the Creoles. The Creoles struck. The East Indians did not join in that. And as a consequence, the strike failed. This, in my judgment, was the genesis of this tension, an ongoing tension that occurred between African, people of African descent and people mm. of Indi Indian descent. It would continue after the 1856 uh, uh, um, riots when there was the question of racial balancing. There was a time, for instance, when um, the, British, the British government or the planters decided that they needed to get uh, more people from India. And as a consequence, there was an immigration policy. And with respect to this immigration policy, many Africans were taxed so as to support the immigration policy that meant that the East Indians would in, fact, would in fact go back to India. As a matter of fact, there's some instances where the Africans actually encouraged East Indians to return because they felt obviously that if they returned, if the extendants returned, the, the, the kind of, of struggle for scarce resources would be less. Mm -hmm. So you have then a second manifestation there of racial, ra you know, racial, uh, racial politics in the part of Let, the establishment. Let's jump, let's jump to the turn of the, the 20th century mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about the 1905 riots which you treat in here okay. and which was also treated by the late Dr. Walter Rodney in his History of the Guyanese Working People. A okay. pivotal um, event in the history of modern Guyana. In my judgment, certainly. Because what happened was that after slavery was, uh, was, uh, was abolished and after apprenticeship was abolished and the Creoles found that they knew what they, 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 the contribution of their labor power, uh, some of them actually stopped working. As a matter of fact, the government they, they, they described it as a caprice of labor. They withdrew the labor capriciously. 
And the result is that many planters and plantations went into, into ruin. Uh, the ex-slaves uh, bought up those plantations and ushered in the village movement. But perhaps uh, more relevantly, they left, many of them left the countryside and went to the urban er areas. And there you had the genesis of an urban proletariat. Uh, many of the people of African descent entered into new occupations. They became teachers, they became uh, lighter men, they, they, they worked in the bauxite industry in the early part of the 20th century, and they, 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 they settled on, on the east bank of Demerara and so on. And more importantly, they became part of the lumpen proletariat. So the yards, the number of yards were established, and of course the yard is something that's very relevant in, in Guyana. Uh, there were instances where there were floating feces, there, there were stevedores, for instance, there, there, there were women who were working as seamstresses, they were working in the government office and so on, in, in, in the governor's office and for, the, and, and for the planters. And in 1905, as a result of some of the strains and so on, there was a riot in the city. Many stevedores were involved in that, um, in that riot, and I think it was very, very important also, not only because of that, but because, again, it, it, it ushered in this whole notion of the consciousness. The consciousness. Ultimately, Ultimately, Hubert Nathaniel Critchlow came on the scene. He came on the scene. Mm -hmm. And he then was instrumental in the formation of the British Guiana Labor Union, which came into existence in 1919 in January. The first trade union, first organized trade, trade union. union in the English-speaking Caribbean. Talk about the importance of that formation, not only for Guyana, but for the rest of the English-speaking Caribbean. Well, it was important for a number of reasons. First of all, it was at once, perhaps, uh, an important manifestation of the extent to which collective labor, collective withdrawal, the importance of one's labor and the extent to which if one organized, this was an important way. Now, it's important to understand, secondly, that whenever you organize, whenever you become part of, 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 of a collective entity, this is a manifestation of power. This is a political action. So normally if you were to go, let us say, to a politician and you say to the politician, you know, I'm David Hines or I'm Maurice St. Pierre, I'm from Guyana, I've got a, certain, a, a problem, they probably pay no attention to you. But if you say that I represent an organization of four or five thousand people, mm -hmm. all of whom are citizens, all of whom are likely to vote, well then you probably get a different reaction. So when they combined for industrial action, this was extremely important. This was followed, and this was very critical also, by the emergence of the British Guiana Workers League and subsequently the Manpower Citizens Association, which was um, headed at that time by Eden, who was a newspaper publisher. Mm -hmm. and, and they were representing primarily East Indians. Ultimately, you got a, co a, lesson, a, co a, co a lesson, coalition actually, of the urban proletariat and the rural, the, rural. the rural proletariat. This occurred in 1924 during the Rheinfeld riots. And talk about the importance of all of that for the 1930s, because the 1930s, to my mind, are important years for the eventual independence movement, the modern independence movement of the 1950s, not only in Guyana, but also in the rest of the Caribbean. Fine. Well, here I think we can slip in the, the importance of the contribution of the indentured servants. Okay. I think it's very, very important. So far, we've been speaking primarily about other racial groups. Uh, after the 1856 <laughs> riots, the, um, the, uh, the Negroes, they were called, constables, uh, did not shoot down the black rioters. As a matter of fact, one, riot, one writer said that they treated the black rioters with suspicious forbearance. Mm -hmm. And the uh, plantocracy decided that uh, obviously these constables, these Negro constables could not be trusted. So they swore in special constables from among the East Indian population. This then created another problem obviously between East Indians and blacks. But what was important was at that point in time, at that point in time, the East Indians were described as the loyal coolies. After they began to experience the trials and tribulations of plantation life, there were all kinds of problems, there were problems with respect to health. They lived in these in, 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 in very bad circumstances. There were mosquitoes, and they had, uh, there was malaria and all kinds of problems. They then began to rise up. There was the question of an, of an effort on the part of the system to colonize their time, 
and their space. They couldn't go beyond the plantation. If they missed seven consecutive days with respect to the daily muster, they were considered to, 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 to have, uh, have been deserted, and therefore they were likely to be arrested. So they then reacted against the system. And in 1935, there was a significant event that occurred on the plantations where a number of them were killed. Interestingly enough, the tendency, therefore, was to use black constables or black police officers to shoot down East Indian workers. The 1930s, as you quite rightly said, also saw disturbances, 1937 in Trinidad, 1938, the from disturbances in Jamaica, very, very important. And this, again, is relevant because the disturbances that occurred in Guyana did not occur in isolation. There was a tendency for them to occur in the other islands, mm -hmm. which would create the impression that there was some clandestine, some underground kind of connection mm -hmm. you know, with, with respect to these. So the 1930s were very, very important. Of course, that was the end of 1930. You had uh, the, 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 the Depression. This then worsened the condition of the, um, of the, um, of the proletariat and this then fueled their desire to react against the system. And of course, the British reacted by sending in commissions into the region. Absolutely. They sent one to Guyana. By the time Dr. Teddy Jagan was elected to the House of Assembly in 1947, mm -hmm. the groundwork had already been done. Yes. Um, and so Jagan enters the fray and the momentum um, is step. stepped up. Big step, yeah. Talked about, talk about um, Teddy Jagan in those early years okay. and um, his contribution. Well, it's important to recognize that there was an infrastructure. By the time uh, Jagan arrived, there was an infrastructure. As we said before, there were the trade unions, there were the friendly and barrel societies, the cooperative societies. These were, all, these were all organized entities, and these then created an, an infrastructure. Now, this was important because it, meaned, it meant, rather, that Dr. Jagan did not have to reinvent the wheel. And indeed, he, along with Ashton Chase, Justin Hubbard, and Mrs. Janet Jagan, who were the founders of the Political Affairs Committee, which came in, into existence in November of 1946, November 1946, mm -hmm. all had union ties. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 1947 elections, uh, Jagan won. He was the lone uh, member of the, of the um, uh, individual who was fighting colonialism, and he was the lone voice speaking on, beha on behalf of the workers. So he then won his seat, a seat in 1947. Uh, before that, however, the Political Affairs Committee was very, very active. They were in Kitty, which is a suburb of Georgetown. They were very, very active in raising the consciousness of people, having intellectuals coming and discussing different issues and so on. Okay, um, we come now to the 1950s, of people in Guyana, um, the PPP winning the elections in 1953, being um, pushed out of office after 133 days the charge of communism. What new information you were able to, and I, I, I do notice some new information here, mm -hmm. that you were able to, to bring to the fore mm -hmm. in this book? Well, there are some things that were very relevant here. As you quite rightly said, uh, the British government, and indeed the Americans since 1948, were very much concerned with the question of communism. And as a result of that, they felt that the PPP administration, which came into, which came into office in 1953, early 1953, was communist, and something should be done about it. What I think was interesting was, 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 first of all, we began to learn, we began to learn as we look, looked at, at what occurred, first of all, why is it that outside troops were used? And one of the reasons for this was because the British felt that they could not trust the police. So once again, you have this, 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 this emphasis on the part of the police, the police not cooperating, as it were, mm -hmm. in terms of, of, um, of um, supporting the system. So they felt that they could not trust them. And this was one of the reasons why they decided to get outside forces. Uh, secondly, what was kind of interesting was that in many instances, the British government decided to get a certain justification. They needed to justify their action in suspending the Constitution. And they went as far as Africa. They, had, they consulted Nkrumah, but there's no evidence that he responded. What happened in the Caribbean, however, was they consulted um, Grantley Adams of Barbados and, and Norman Manley of Jamaica, both of whom were considered to be very, very important people in the Caribbean, and both of whom condemned the PPP action. So they used that to, to make the point that, that obviously they were doing something right. Interestingly enough also, after the Constitution was, um, was suspended, a number of leaders were detained, one of whom was um, Sidney King at the time, and now Ayusi Kwayana. And the British government, 
what they did was they set up a commission, and this commission was meant to get statements from these five detainees. Now, each one of them wrote a statement. Now, Sidney can you see Kwayana's uh, statement. In his sta statement, he said that although he doesn't consider himself to be a communist of the stripe of Lenin, it is his understanding that based on what a communist does, he is a communist. The British government seized on this because this was the first admission by a top member of the PPP that he was a communist and therefore the party was communist. And they attempted to use this, they thought about using this particular admission on the part of King to support to just support the justification for suspending the Constitution during the debate in 19, which occurred subsequently in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they decided against it subsequently on the advice of, of the government. So I did not know that before, and that certainly was something that was new also. Um, quickly, we are running, running out of time. Burnham's role in these early years. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that in general, um, Jagan was very much more active than, you know, than Burnham was. As a matter of fact, there was some feeling that, that, that Burnham um, delayed, you know, for instance, the advent of the, um, of the PPP because he couldn't make a decision as to whether he wanted to join or not. Uh, he subsequently, as you know, um, was um, considered to be the, 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 the um, I think that the, the leader of the house, not, not of the, the house, chairman, of the, the chairman, chairman of, the party. of the party, that's right. And, and he decided that, that he wanted to be leader of, of, of the party and therefore leader of the movement. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, caused some problems. There was a split ult ultimately. And he really, I would imagine, came into his own probably maybe after the 1957 elections. Right. And of course, you take it up to 1966 with the time of independence, anatomy of resistance, anti-colonialism in Guyana, 1823-1966. Dr. Sinpier, um, it's been a pleasure talking with you here in Carib Nation. Is there a number or information that you want to give our yes. audience where they can pick up this book? Yes, of course. If you need further information, you can get it by calling area code 410-321-0036. Or email Oshi O O C H E E at AOL dot com. Any bookstores around there? Not as yet, not at the moment. The book was published by in London by Macmillan, mm -hmm. and I would imagine that at some point in time this will occur. Thank you very much. Thank um, you for being here. And uh, thank you for tuning in to yet another edition of Carib Nation. I want to recommend this book highly to you. It's, um, it's a treatise on Guyanese political history and the Caribbean political history. Until the next time, this is David Hines thanking you once again for tuning in to Carib Nation. And remember, as always, our motto here is one people, one culture, one Caribbean, one nation. Rally around the West Indies. <laughs>